And welcome back this week to another episode of the Candid Cox Cast, where we basically talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly when it comes to coxing and rowing. And this is our second installment in the rivalry series that I'm super excited to um, kick off now. So leading off with Cambridge, we're going to start talking to the Blue Boats and see um, how much you guys know about your history, um, learn a little bit about your club, and then talk about the boat race, of course. So without further ado, um, I'd love to introduce my co-hosts, Dara, Natan, and Matthew. And if you guys wouldn't mind just telling us a little bit about who you are and when you rode in the boat race or Cox, and we'll go from there. So Dara, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm Dara Alazade, um, and I, so I rode in the boat race in 2018 and 2019. Um, and uh, I was president in 2019, um, and yeah, and I'm now currently taking a hiatus to skull full time and have one more year left to go. At Cambridge. At Cambridge, yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. And what about you, Natan? Uh, so I also rode in 2019. I did only one year uh, master's program. Uh, started with Dara and Matthew. And now uh, I'm also taking some time to just train full time for the national team, uh, also in also in sculling, uh, so uh, similar to Dara. And you also rode at Cal, right? So you're yes, exactly. So uh, I graduated at Cal in 2018. I went straight to Cambridge for one year. Okay, okay, very cool. And you are shooting for Tokyo as well, right? In the single. Yes, exactly. So it was uh, in a single, yes. For for now, I'm in a single. Um, so that's the, that's the plan. So is it going to be a Bermuda-Poland showdown in the final? <laughs> yeah, in the final. Yeah. Lanes <laughs> three and four. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think we, we said that you were rowing for Bermuda. Oh, but yeah, yeah. Not- and so, so, so this year and for, uh, and for the foreseeable future, uh, I'll be, yeah, I'm sculling for Bermuda. How does that even happen? <laughs> like, how, how did that happen? Uh, so Bermuda's home. Um, and I mean, I, so, and I am Bermudian. So, uh, and there's like a Bermuda, uh, Bermuda Rowing Association. And there was actually a scholar, uh, Shelly Pearson, who rode in Rio. Um, so I'm not, and I'm not the first scholar. I'm not even the first male scholar. I think the the last time before Shelly, a Bermudian scholar, rode at the Olympics was 1972. Some guy, I think he just like signed up and showed up. <laughs> That's amazing. I know it's yeah. so cool. You just don't hear that. You don't hear Bermuda and rowing thrown around too much. So oh, really you cool. will. Give, give it eight months and you will. <laughs> oh, yeah. Good. Good. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> that is awesome. And Matt, go ahead. Uh, I'm Matthew Holland. I um, coxed the Cambridge Women's Blue Boat in 2017, and then I coxed Dara and Natan in 2019. And I learned to cox at Westminster School on the Tideway in London for five years before I came up to Cambridge. And then I took this year out to finish up my master's degree in organic chemistry. <laughs> so. That's amazing. And if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, are you the first cox to win both the men's and women's boat race? On the Tideway, certainly. I believe a couple of people, the women's race used to be in Henley for a long time, and I believe a couple of people before that have done both. I think Asa Nethercott, the legendary Oxford Cox, and Olympic Cox, he coxed both the men's and women's boats at Oxford. But certainly since the race has moved to the Tideway, I'm the first to win both, yeah. No big deal. deal. (laughs) That's absolutely amazing. And so why choose Cambridge in the first place? I'm curious, from all three of you, what what is it about Cambridge that, that was the draw? It's better. (laughs) <laughs> all right next question yeah <laughs> Done. Was, it, uh, I mean, was it cool was it the boat race itself did you get recruited like how did uh, how did you so, end up so for me um so i don't i mean i had always wanted to be involved sorry i always wanted to be involved in the boat race um and then uh there were a couple of pen guys so before i went to cambridge i was at pen in the u.s and there were a couple of pen guys who were at Cambridge. So Grant Wilson was in 2013, and then Matt Jackson was in 2014 and 15. Um, and after Penn, I came to the UK uh, to teach 
um, to teach econ or economics and coach rowing at Winchester College. Um, and part of that was just like, I thought it was a really cool opportunity, but the other part was that I, it was just going to be in the UK. So I'd be around, you know, I could go check out the, you know, the schools and stuff. Um, and so I had in mind that I was going to be close to, you know, Cambridge. Um, and I was, you know, I could look at the programs and the different courses and stuff. And, you know, I found a situation that worked for me, uh, in terms of course selection. And, uh, you know, I knew a lot of the guys on Cambridge and, I had been speaking with the coach and they just had a very welcoming nature about him. And so I applied and, and here we are. And that's awesome. What about you, Natan? Cause you, I mean, you're all over the place, Cal and Poland and. Yeah. So for me, um, it was also always my, my dream. I would watch the boat race when I was little every year. And uh, it was something in the back of my head I always wanted to do. So I was in my last year at Cal and I was looking to do more if that's impossible. And I picked Cambridge for mostly for two reasons. One, the program was um, was really well suited for me, uh, I thought, and uh, which is one, what I wanted to do and uh, also what I could do at that time. And then I also thought I hit it off really well with the coaches right away. Um, they connected me to some other guys and, um, and also it just seems to me immediately that um, they also have a lot of fun, not only school and rowing. So um, that culture just appealed to me, and uh, and uh, that was just a second factor also. And what about you, Matthew? Uh, I guess it was there was a fam. I've got a strong family tradition of Cambridge. My mother, my father, and my grandfather all studied here. And for me, the course was what drew me to it. I wanted to study a broad range of sciences, and it's not possible at any other UK university realistically to study the sort of program that you get with the natural sciences. And I wasn't actually sure if I was going to row or not when I first arrived, because um, I, I wasn't sure how the work was going to work out. But Rob Baker, who was the coach for the women at the time and is now the coach for the men, he dropped me a message saying, do you want to come and chat about it? And I came and chatted and he convinced me. So I started trialing for the women in my first year and then took off from there. That's amazing. And you, I have to say, are one of the most interesting people I think I've ever met, by the way. You you have like the most wide array of hobbies and talents. What are some of the other things that you were doing? I remember talking about this at Leander and you were telling me about like the tea and singing and like some of the other things you do. Yeah, I'm into some slightly weird stuff. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I do a lot of singing. Um, so the part in 2018 and this year, I've been a choral scholar at my college in Cambridge, and that's involved some cool stuff. So we sing uh, five nights a week in chapel, and then we go and do tours and concerts. Music's always been quite a big part of my life. And that included singing at Stephen Hawking's funeral, which was quite a special occasion. Um, and then, yeah, I did also used to do some tea tasting. I used to work around London as a tea taster and <laughs> submit my notes. And I used to get sent the samples and taste the teas and do give blending advice. Yeah, I used to love that. I've given that up basically now. There's not time to do both, but I did used to like drinking very in a former life. tea. Yeah, exactly. Back in the good old days, I used to sit there sipping tea quite. I didn't know about Stephen Hawking too. That's absolutely incredible. That was that quite was a special occasion actually. He was a, he's a, he was a fellow at my college. And so being in the choir, we get to sing at dinners and feasts and things. So I got, I was fortunate enough to meet him three times, which was quite special. And then when he died, the choir sang at his funeral. So. That was quite cool. That's incredible. And so um, some of you guys who have a lot of international experience too, how do you compare the international experience to having to come together now um, to do the boat race? So you have these guys from all different nationalities, all different backgrounds, clubs, and now you have to sort of meld these backgrounds and strokes together. Is it any different than university rowing or... What is it like? So I feel I thought, I thought it was great because uh, everyone brings something new to the table, um, some you know some things, something special. Uh, it's a little bit tricky in Cambridge, and because it's only one year, a lot of guys are there for one year, so there's not much time to actually get everyone together. So um, it's really important to have like one thought of what we want to do and what is the easiest way to actually get everyone on the same on the same page. Uh, so there's definitely some some obstacles, but I thought mostly it's uh, it's very really good to have those different opinions because uh, everyone learned a uh, little different things and you can use them all to, uh, you know, to work it out even better. Yeah, yeah, I, I, th I think so. I mean, that's, that is the challenge of um, the, the 
Cambridge structure, uh, and, and really the boat race, so I guess both Fox and Cambridge, is that um, you have a lot of, you'll have guys who are undergrads who come for three, four years, um, but you'll also have people come in, you know, like Natan came for a one-year master's, you'll have graduate students come in. Um, so you really, each year is, there is some carryover from the previous year, but there's also a lot of new guys coming in who, who come from different backgrounds, different abilities, uh, different programs. And um, it's the, the challenge, I think, for both clubs is getting everyone onto the same page. Like, this is how we're going to do it. This is how we, you know, this is how we operate. And, um, but then also, you know, learning from other, you know, learning from what guys bring into the program. Um, so I think, you know, and it would be, you know, it's sort of like Natan said, you know, coming in from a different program, you got to quickly learn, but you also bring things that you, you know, from like the U.S. system. So like the U.S. system, I, you know, from Penn specifically, we weren't like the most technical rowing school, um, but which, and that was a huge change coming to Cambridge where it's a lot more technical about every detail of the stroke and, um, you know, how you, how you you know, the pattern of rowing. Um, but, you know, the guys who come over from the U.S. Uh, said, to, you know, during my two years there, there have been like, you know, six or seven, I think. Um, they bring a lot of like racing experience, just like they're just, it's their dogs basically. And which I think is really important. Like, you know, there's a lot of aggression that comes from, you know, like just racing. Um, and, you know, the part of that is like learning how to work hard in chaos and the boat race can be chaos and like you have to be able to improvise some of it like you know obviously both sides have you know their strengths so like the technical aspect of it is important because it's a long race you can't just muscle the whole thing but on the other side you need to be able to you know adapt and just at the, like the heart of it be a racer um so yeah and, and that's something that you know the guys who come in and join the program bring and like raise the standard up and that's just why it gets better every year what I think is quite important too is to bear in mind when you're building to putting together a boat for the boat races. As they say, you've got a collection of guys with such a wide experience coming for one year. So you've got to pick what's actually important to focus, what's actually going to give you the best boat speed for the amount of time that you've got available. And I think it's very easy to get fixated on the idea that absolutely everything has to be perfect on race day. But actually, I don't think that's the case. And I think you can race as an unpolished diamond to the extent that if you've got the right underlying network in place that you can do enough to win if that makes sense like you can waste time spending sessions and sessions and sessions making every little aspect feel absolutely perfect but you've got to weigh up in your head as a coach and as a competitor how much difference that's overall going to make in the six or seven months that you've got available it's not like you've got a four-year cycle where you can make everything perfect you need to identify and streamline your process so that you can focus on what's going to make you go fastest in the time you've got available and i think to yeah, me that was the biggest difference coming from a schoolboy program to a university program was aside from the fact that we had loads more beans and loads more experience was actually it was it had to be much more streamlined we had uh, the coach, rob had to pick what was important and make sure that he really hammered that home do you think that because you have such a short amount of time you have these guys that come in you know like natan for a year and you're pretty much ready to hit the ground running go on natan. yeah like we already had some the first races were probably you know two weeks or like a couple of weeks in uh when i was there uh we had the force had the brief championship so so it wasn't much time and then everything happened so quickly uh, the boat race also so much earlier than any other race it's like march april so not not much time to, to actually work everything out like matthew said all the details so um so definitely there's some ups ups and downs you have to work around and just pick what what matters most for for the speed for the boat to be uh, to be fast i think also on that like getting guys who are new up to speed with it like how, like just how fast the boat race comes, um, like just and you know so like Natan, I think you showed up because you had worlds and then you showed up like yeah. end of September, right? And like yeah, like you said, two weeks later, you're what were we like at the Brit Champs? And so, yeah, exactly. um, and it's but it's just getting guys to understand each year that like you know everyone else in the like in the rowing world is getting ready for like either like the eastern sprints or pack 12s or, or the ira or henley which is you know june july we're getting ready to go for you know M march april and like so when we show up in september 
that's effectively December for everyone. Like, like, you know, in terms of your fitness and where you have, like how much time you have left, it would be like everyone at, you know, everyone at Leander just showing up in December being like, okay, we're going to get ready to go for the, the race. No, that doesn't happen. Like they, they get ready and, you know, everyone gets ready early, you know, late into the, in the summer, early fall, they get going and they have all that time to build it up. So like, I think for us, it's even, it starts in the summer where it's like, guys, like, we have to, you know, make sure you're ready. We don't have time to fuss about. Like, we don't have time to try everything. Like, we have to get it right. And we have to get it right, you know, now. And I guess the other con- the other thing is that work starts thick and fast right at the beginning of October. So yeah. not only have you then got this, you know, six-month window to try and get from a bunch of guys who've come from loads of different programs to a boat that's got to win the boat race. But on top of that, you've got two terms to deal with. And Cambridge terms are pretty intense. They're only eight weeks long, but the work that gets thrown at you is really, really hard and teaching comes thick and fast. So not only are you suddenly thrown into an environment where every day you're desperately trying to get better and you're in some sense, you know, competing almost every week, but you've also got a pile of work to be getting on with and you've got academic pressure on you and as well as the rowing pressure. So it does get very intense very quickly. Yeah, that makes total sense. And so I don't actually think a lot of people know how the boats are even selected. So when you show up, um, you know, say you're showing up for a one year masters or whatever you're showing up for and you're new, um, how how do you actually do selections for the boat? Do you already know that you're gonna be in the mix or how how do selections work? No, so I think it's 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 a collection of things. So um yeah, so like again, we don't have a lot of time to try everything you know we don't have oh uh, okay well we've got this cup race coming up and if it doesn't go well then you know it doesn't work then we can shuffle it around and try it again we've got a couple of fixtures uh we've, and we've got trilates um but the, you know so the selection process is i mean it's it's more conve- so you know there's your conventional aspects which are seat racing and or tests and you know how the boat's going with someone in it and where they're sitting and there are that's why you know we have to take advantage of the very limited windows we have to this is selection time and we have to make a decision here um and and you know i think a big part of that comes from you know what the coaches think what you know this how the boat is feeling uh you know if it's it's like wow okay it's really feeling good like all right let's let's go with this like you know i mean i think we can if we if we feel good about this then you know we can move forward with it yeah, absolutely. And I actually remember doing the fixtures against you guys and yeah. it was hard. I mean, it was, I mean, I had so much more respect for that kind of coxing even because here in the US, I mean, you probably know we don't race like that. You learn to not necessarily have points. I mean, you obviously you can speak more to this, Matthew, but you're essentially just racing off of each other in a way. But also knowing the personality of the water and sort of hoping for the best so that everyone's sort of on the same trajectory and that you don't clash. And I would it, say hoping is the wrong word, but um, <laughs> yeah. What, what's so brilliant about the boat race in, that's not that you don't get with the multi-lane stuff? With multi-lane stuff, it's got to become a lot more individual because you've got such a large field. You've got to have an idea of how you, the process that you're going to follow to get from A to B. And then for, to an extent, you sort of fit the other crews around that because it's not possible, to, possible realistically to race every single other race across the field. But what's so brilliant about the boat race is it is literally just you and them. And if you're ahead, you're going faster. If you're behind, you're going slower. And it's the point. And you've got the challenge of actually, all I need to do is beat this one person. All I need to do is beat this one other boat. And it, the intensity that boils down to is quite exciting. I think I don't think I think it compares like to nothing else. I think the fact that you've just got you sit there on the start and you just look across and there's one other guy in the seat opposite you and it's just like, oh brilliant, bring it on. It's oh, gosh, I mean it was so exciting. Yeah, yeah. I, I was um, at Ariel Kensington um, just past Hammersmith watching you guys and you you're just sweating the whole time. It's so like it's so exciting just watching. We were too. <laughs> yeah, oh, don't say. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's like the atmosphere is like nothing else and and steering it and just, you know, knowing the personality of the river and having done it before I would, you know, it's it's nerve wracking watching it. But it's, you know, I had so much more respect for it after having done it and realizing how much like how difficult it really is. I think the hard part is also in terms of steering the river that there's no it's not like multi lane where you have lanes and there's no or even at Henley where you've got the boom. So you have an idea of the section of the river that belongs to you. 
realistically in the boat race, the river, there's no boys. They don't boy it out. They don't say this is where you need to go. It's up to you to decide. And there is one area of the river that is moving faster than the other. And we can't both be in it at the same time. And I guess your job is a, as a cox is to make sure that your crew is as spends as much of that as much of the race as possible in the water that is faster than their opponents. And it often doesn't come boil down to a case of being in exactly the right place. As long as you're more in right, as in more of a right place than they are, that's what's important. Because again, it's a re it's a match against the other crew. It's not like a head race where you need to put yourself perfectly in the line the whole way because you're racing in such a huge field. It's just a question of actually. I've got to be in better water than they do for as much of the race as possible. And so it's sort of in some sense a three-way game because you're battling the river, you're battling the opponents, but you're also battling the umpire whose job it is to try and keep you apart. Talk about the personality of the Tideway a little bit because it's really, I mean, there's so much going on on that section of the river. It's an angry beast for sure. It, um, well, so it's so changeable from day to day. So, you know, a couple of days before the boat race, we had a session where we were bailing the water out and flicking the pumps on and you've got waves crashing over you and you've got to you've got to go out in that because if that happens on boat race day they will run the race we don't stop for anything other than lightning so you've got to train for the fact that actually it can be really burly and they can it can be deceptive in the sense that some chunks of it can be very quiet you can be very quiet off the start then come around a corner and boom the headwind hits you or go along the air and suddenly you've got massive waves coming at you and that yeah it's a really it's living in the sense that it's got it's so different in different parts of it and because it covers such a large range it's got a bend in it and everything you can get different conditions across different stretches so you can basically encounter the full force of nature across the entire thing from beautiful calm to horrendous winds and waves and does it kind of feel like that to you guys Sarah and Natan like you obviously have to depend on your coxswain so so much going through that but um besides just kind of doing whatever he tells you to do what is your part in that like how does it feel just being in in so many different kinds of water and how do you adjust yeah for me that was actually quite difficult uh, i was just used to racing you know normal 2k you have a line and the only thing that matters pretty much is your performance versus their performance and and here um you know you're racing of course you're racing the other boat but then like you said there's the river which is sometimes it can be very rough and then there's no lane so um actually you know the clashing uh, it it made me quite uh you know quite freaked out because you do can uh you know you can quickly catch a crab or uh one of our pictures we uh, broke our i think one of our backstays so then you go from one length up immediately to one length down so it's um uh, it's quite a lot of risk in that and i guess i wasn't that comfortable with, with that uh, so you know just the clashing it just um, it was difficult for me to just switch from from one one uh, you know mentality to the highway mentality just just a uh, lot of many factors you can't really control that well that's you know that's part of the preparation you've got to be ready for any situation that comes up and that means you know at the start it could be nice and flat and um whereas but when you come around hammersmith it could be you know it could completely change and you know oh <laughs> no oh. cares in the house. <laughs> Let's go. Sharing my screen. Should we just push it on? I don't know. Uh, well, uh, let's see. I'm yeah, gonna my, my... You should you should take it over. Thanks. Uh, we, we so had a technical call. Thanks so. for covering uh, me there, Whitney. I'll just yeah. I'll just jump in now. <laughs> Welcome back to drive time with. <laughs> Gin tasting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There she is. Here. Oh, look. Yay! I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's all right. I think, you know, for our race in 2019, I think we were pretty lucky that, like, it was nothing. I mean, it was like anything. There was a bit of a tailwind, like, nice, puffy little tailwind to help us along. Um, and in 2018, it was actually the same thing. But, like, in 20, was it 2016? Yeah, yeah had it, where it yeah. was like it was okay at the start, and then as you came around Hammersmith, it got really bad. So like, but you have to prepare for that. Like you have to say, okay, like when I thinking about a race strategy, like that's like around Hammersmith, it's gonna get it's gonna turn to mud basically, and it's gonna be really slow, and everyone's gonna be sloshing about, and it's gonna be chaos. Like we need to prepare for that, like and adjust everything else accordingly. 
And like we have electric pump, we can fit our boat out. The boat is basically like a battle tank. It's a custom made boat. So it's different to any of the shells that you find anywhere else in the world, really. And it's got special designs of riggers so that we can get tapped down a bit further above the waves. And it's got fittings so that I've got a little switch. And if it gets really full of water and we've put them in, I can flick a button and an electric pump, start basically pumping water out of the boat. And it's then it's got special uh, bow guard to divert the waves and then we can extend the sax board so we can basically make it as bulletproof as we can get it. So you can kit the boat, boat out for if the conditions are pretty nasty. And so how do you actually come up with a race plan for such a long race? Like we get a lot of questions and especially from younger coxswains asking about how not to repeat myself. And even for normal head races, how do I how do I just not say the same thing over and over again? How do you plan for so many different conditions and such a long race? I think it's about, for me, it's about responding to what's happening in front of you. So a large amount of, a large amount of what we do is actually sort of our race plan is actually through putting ourselves in scenarios. Cause it's all very well to sit around as a crew and say, oh, well, you know, we do this, if this happens, we do that, if that happens. When push comes to shove, that doesn't really mean very much to have sat around a table. So in training, Rob will put us in situations where we'll be down with the, we'll, the Goldie reserve boat in front of us, or we'll start with the Goldie reserve boat behind us, or in fixtures, you'll put yourself in situations where we'll go out when the conditions are really, really bad. And then you sit down afterwards and discuss it. And just the fact of going through that experience gives you a, a sort of memory bank in your head to know actually we've been there we've done this and so that for me could give me a scenario say oh look we've been here we've done this in this fixture right boys we know we can go through this um but i mean i personally think as a cock there's nothing wrong with repeating yourself if what you're saying is relevant like you can only respond to what you've got in front of you, you can only respond to the race that you've got unfolding in front of you or the conditions and if you've prepared something that works for the conditions then saying it again is not a problem as long as it's the work just sitting there parroting nothing probably isn't very helpful but uh if you've worked on a call as a crew and you know that in the situation that you're in, it works, there's nothing wrong with saying it several times. You, you have, it's like, to me, I see it in two ways, you, two parts. You have it as the, like the big action, like big general action. So like, you know, the course, and you're like, okay, here is like a three minute stretch. That's just a straight line. Like, or, you know, you know, this is a section. So you break it up into sections. You're like, all right, in here, like this is roughly what we're going to, like pretty much what we're going to do. And it's very simple. And you talk about that beforehand and everyone knows that's what you're going to do. That I think is a key thing is actually breaking the course down into manageable chunks yep. because an 18, an 18 minute race is a very long time, but one minute chunks are manageable and you can focus on something for one minute. And, and yeah. And then, yeah. so that's, that's the first part. And then the other half is like what, what I think is like just planning for situational rowing. And that obviously the coxswain plays a big part in that because, you know, there are so many, and I guess, you know, thinking about like a head, like combining the two things, a head race on the tideway, there are so many things that can happen uh, that you have to like in your decision making. So like, okay, are, you know, am I in the stream? Yes or no. You know what I mean? Like there's so many things like, is it windy? Is it rough water? Are we coming up on a boat? Are we passing a boat? Are we getting pat? Like all these things that you have to think, all right, what's the situation we're in? And then like Matthew said, you got to practice that in like your training sessions. And then the, the, the key thing is it's not, it's no panic, but there's always a sense of urgency as to each section. So like, okay, in this section, this is what we're doing as everyone remembers, cause we talked about it and then, and we practice and then any adjustments, like the coxswain knows the adjustment and then you say, right, here's what like the situation is and this is what we're going to do. Ready, go. Uh, and I think that just, and, and like, if you can break a race up like that, like, okay, we've come to that three minute, in the middle that we talked about this is what we're focusing on like we're just pushing here really hard all right coming around the bend like starboard do this and ports you know like just like okay here's my focus for the next 90 seconds you know cox and stroke you know they know they can they can talk back and forth to each other and then it's like right this is the this is the call and everyone knows like what each call means and how to execute it and that's i think it's as simple as that it's simple no but like it's as that's what i would do <laughs> Yeah, simple for you who doesn't have to come up with all the calls and the strategy. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I think communication is key yeah. too, though. Like the rowers, the guys that are doing it, and you've got the stroke in front of you. So I would often put my mic mute on my mic and have a get some words from Natal and see what he thinks. Yeah, I guess on a head race is also super important just to you know for Coxen uh, to communicate with the crew, um, you know where we are, like what are the margins, because the rowers they can't really see uh, see what's happening. Like if we're you know if we're walking on a boat or or not like depending on the you know the, the time differences so for me that was always crucial where we are at the 
at the course and you know how we are doing because the racing component you know you don't have a boat for most of the time next to you so you know it's always good to just keep you know the boat on the racing racing mode I think you shouldn't be afraid of being quiet too. Like some periods of just getting on with it are fine. Like you shouldn't feel like the need to, 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 fill the, to fill the entire race with noise. Otherwise it starts meaning very little and people stop listening. If you can sit quiet for a bit and give them just a time to focus on what they're doing and then just come in, it's more, a lot more powerful. And I think that's harder to learn than people think. It, it's yeah. difficult oh, to be quiet. It's something I never mastered. I would never shut up. Oh yeah, same, same. I had to learn. Absolutely. And they were like, it's okay to be quiet and not say anything. And I was like, oh, you know what? Actually, that's easier for me too. It feels weird though. It does feel weird because you feel like what feels like yeah. minutes is actually not very long, but you're sat there in silence. It's like, well, what do I do? It's an eternity. Yeah, It, it feels fly. like a very long time. Yeah, absolutely. And so I have to ask before I move on to some of the rivalry questions, because I love some of this stuff. What is the mood at the starting line? What does it feel like when you're just sitting there with thousands of people around waiting me, to go? For me, both times, this was my biggest surprise. And I spent a very long time before both of my races thinking, oh, my God, I'm going to be so nervous. Like, How am I going to control my nerves? And then for me, I got attached to the state boat and suddenly just like I looked around and it was just like, hang on a sec. This is the best feeling in the world. Like you've got the helicopter, you've got the crowds in the bank. And it surprised me so much both times because I thought I would be absolutely bricking it. And you get there and just like this rocks. These guys have all come out for us like you've got Oxford alongside. Yeah, but like this is what we've been waiting for for almost looking forward to since September, actually. This is what we're here for. And I just, it, it's, it's, that was my biggest surprise. But actually, for me, the start line is the best feeling in the world in the boat race. Yeah, for me also. Um, so I thought it was really great because, you know, you're on the start line, a lot of people are watching. And especially on the start line, there's, you know, many, many ways you can mess something up. So especially with the, you know, the current going underneath you, uh, it's very tricky. But I thought, for us, we did really great, especially with, uh, you know, you and Freddie uh, being on the race before. And I remember a couple of days before the race, you would just tell everyone that, uh, you know, it's okay to just take a moment, take a minute on the start line and just look around, actually enjoy the experience. And because it's, you know, it doesn't really happen that often it's like one in lifetime experience. So for me, that was, uh, it was amazing because of course you're stressed and you're, you're focused for focus on the race, but just being able to also experience the, you know, the incredible um, event is also, that was, for me, that was definitely the best. Yeah, I think just to tag on that, that's exactly right that, you know, both Matthew and Tom nailed it. Like just having that moment of, and like even before the start line of, you, you know, because you walk out and the crowd is, there, I mean, you know, there's the coin flip and there's, you know, the whole, there's a whole production about it, um, but it's, like it's it's taking that time and i think it's important to not try to just be like just like ignore it ignore it like it's not as i'm just i'm just here to row my thing and like that has its that has its place but i think like that moment where you look around and you know like matthew said there's a helicopter there's like there's this boat right next to the start line like a yacht or something with like packed with people and then you look down the full wall and it's just lined like like 30 people deep the whole way down uh, and, the, you know, the bridge and um, and it's just like, whoa, like this is cool. Like, and th this is, I'm, I'm a, I'm like a, I'm a football player. Like, you know what I mean? Like, this is like the NFL or I'm, I'm in Premier League. Like this, this is that. And there's like murmur of a crowd. And then, and then, and then like, so like it's switching from that, like, cool, like take it all in, appreciate it. And then it's like, okay, like now two minutes ago, like, right like like bring it back in like just focus on your breathing like just okay now all i'm doing is individually is what we know how to do just bring it back like try to keep it nice and like relaxed and breathing exactly and do you guys have any traditions either before or after you race hopefully get drunk afterwards <laughs> <laughs> that's fair yeah, we can have that as a tradition if you like <laughs> Absolutely. You guys don't have anything like because it's such a big rivalry and there's so much history. There's there's nothing that you necessarily do before or after either if you win or to get ready well, before uh, you launch. Well, there was there was one thing. We, so we did uh, in so we did it last year in the 2019 race, and then we had done it in 2018 as well. Where the night before we got everyone together 
you know, we just, it was sort of like, a, I remember in 2019, I, you know, I, I said a few things and then I kind of just opened the floor to be like, you know, guys, this is it. Like, you know, the whole year, you know, this is like, this is the show, enjoy it, you know, but then focus it back in. Like, you know what you're doing. Like, this is a really special, you know, like it just kind of opened the floor to like people to say whatever they wanted. It generally, and what's awesome about the club is that it turns into a bit of like a, lo- not a love fest, but like, like just appreciation for everyone. And it was like, you know, like, you know, guys, it's like, it's been it's really fun. And like, cause you know, cause this is it. Like, and, and after this, you know, after, you know, tomorrow, who knows what's going to happen, but you know, we're ready and we're really proud to have what, you know, what we've done up to this. And, you know, I'm really proud to row with you guys. And, um, I think that, that's, uh, I hope, you know, uh, that's something that I think that they've done for a while as, as a club. So you think I'm saying for traditions of a club, like that's, that's one thing that I think is really, really important that, you know, is done every year. Yeah. I noticed at one point too, Matthew, I think you had, um, champagne in one of the wellies. That's who you drink champagne out of one of the wellies. I would hope that that does not become a tradition. No. <laughs> <laughs> was... Fred suggested it would be a good idea to do a shoe. And at the time, I thought it was also a good idea to do a shoe. A few days later, I realized it was not a very good idea to drink. Uh, yeah, I, would not, I... I would not recommend the welly. I really <laughs> wouldn't. I think there's another one. Like we have one here, too, where somebody drinks out of a boat shoe. And I think it's disgusting. Yeah, like, I would not. So... I... Oh, would not advocate the welly. I really wouldn't. Getting into the rivalry a little bit, does any of the rivalry or the history come into play when you're actually training? Like when you show up, you have this very finite amount of time to train. How is it sort of ingrained in you that like you need to beat these guys? But is there something that's kind of special about this rivalry in particular that you kind of bring out day to day? I think for me, it was like, I definitely felt the weight of history in my shoulders and that there was, what, 170-something years of CUBC boys who'd sat on each start line doing the same thing. And I certainly felt, to me, like I had to... One of the things that motivated me was, like, we've got to do these boys proud. Like, there'll be hundreds of boys watching us who've done the race before, who know exactly what we're feeling. And actually, it's up to me to try and train my hardest so that we can... We can that experience can be truly shared between us. And that, that to me, motivated me a lot throughout the season was the thought of actually like sitting in our captain's room and you've got the names of all the crews, every single person who's raced the boat race is on the wall in our room. It's just like, you've got to really earn the right to put your name up there. And that, that motivated me a lot. Yeah, there's such a legacy there. Exactly. That you're carrying forward. Yeah. And do you kind of feel that too, Natan? Um, you know, like you're coming from Cal, um, who also has an incredibly strong culture. Um, you know, the Cal Washington duel like you, you've got rivalries all over the place. <laughs> so like, how does it feel coming here and then having all of this to defend as well? You're like, you're thrown into another big rivalry. Yeah, I definitely agree with Matthew that the whole legacy part is super important. And, you know, there's so much tradition and um, you're part of something bigger, you know, something that has been going on for, for such a long time. And now it's your turn to live up to was the standard and you know to the uh, to the history uh, and another thing is that usually when you're even when you're racing in the states or nationally you're racing multiple uh multiple universities multiple you know countries even if uh, there's some rivalries it's still um there's still medals um there's still you know other crews to consider there's almost never only you know one crew we're gonna race against and in the board race, you have only Oxford, and uh, you only train to to beat those guys. So it's definitely more, you know, directed uh, to to beating them because that's in the end of the day, that's the only thing that matters. It doesn't matter if you have, you know, a super close race or if you're doing great the whole year. You know, if you lose, then if you're second, then you're you're lost, and that's that's it. You're, you know, you you want you didn't make it, so the whole year is you know is over for you. Yeah. It's not necessarily like just going to IRAs or anything. It's like you you have you have one shot. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And there's no semifinals, there's no heats, there's no reps. It's just, you know, one race and and whoever wins, they're gonna be remembered by the history as as you know uh, as winners on that day. I think I think another part of it is like because like like Natan mentioned, like because this is the only other like 
we trained solely for the purpose of, of winning the boat race and the one team in the way of our holding that trophy out is Oxford. So like, I, I think structurally it turns into, well, what is, you know, Oxford is training to stop you from holding that trophy out, like from winning that race. And like, so thus it does turn into like a, well, what are they doing? Or, you know, so in the back of your mind, you're thinking when you're training, like, oh, like, well, am I, am I pushing hard right now? Or like, or am I getting, you know, am I getting outworked right now? Like, and that, I think that does play into it. And I think that can be a, a motivating factor. I don't know. It, it's sort of the strange aspect of like a rivalry. Like, of course, you, like they are the ones you want to beat and beating them means a success like that. Your year is successful if you beat them. You know, it'd be interesting to hear kind of Natan's thing on the, like view on this, uh, applying it to the Cal and Washington, like dichotomy. I, like, I wouldn't say it's like a hatred thing. Like, I didn't, I didn't go to games being like, I hate those Oxford guys. Like, I, I didn't, it's not like boiling in my blood. And I, and I, I, I respect them as racers. I think, you know, they do a good job and. It would be just like silly to be like, oh, I, I just despise those guys. But like, I, I think the fact that like I have a relationship with some of them and like because of the structure, it just means that much more like we have to beat them. We have to beat them. There's no, there's no saying, oh, well, we got close. No, 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 that's not good enough. Like we have to have to beat this one club and the rest of the year like, eh. Yeah, and I, w- I definitely wouldn't say there's, you know, there's hatred between Khan and Washington also. Uh, you know, definitely the rival rival get, gets intense, but I would rather say that uh, there's a lot of respect because you know you wonder how they are so good, how they are so fast, um, and you, of course you want to beat them, but at the same time you respect them so much because you know you know what you did, you know how hard you trained, and you know they are still able to go so fast. So you know it just builds builds it up and adds you know the intensity to it, which is which is really great. At the end of the day, they're basically the same as us, just on the other side yeah. of the divide. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, what's nice is we get to hang out with them sometimes, like afterwards, like, yeah. you know, like at Henry. I really enjoyed that. Or like, a, you know, like there's, um, you know, there's like there's alums go on on racing trips and they kind of hang out and like, but especially at Henley, I think you're, you're kind of just all there, right? And you, and I remember like it was a, I didn't like, obviously in 2018 before I met a lot of them, like I didn't like hate them. I mean, I coached some of them. Some of them I know really well. Like, uh, but it was just spending time with them away from that high pressure situation. You're like, huh, like, oh, okay. Yeah. They're, they're, they're basically like us. They, you know, they, they work really hard. They train They're you know, they're methodical. They're, you know, all that stuff that we are. And it's just about, you know, like it, it, it sort of humanizes them a bit. There's also a mutual understanding that you've both been through the same basic kind of thing. Like you've both wanted to win and you've both, sat down on the start line, you've both ground out the miles. So like, realistically, we've been through basically the same process. Do you guys have any any fun ways that you kind of throw shade at each other or make fun of each other? There's a really easy way to do that. There's one way to do that. There's only one way. And Just it is? Win. win. Just beat them? Yeah. The ultimate gentleman's sport. Just let the results speak for themselves. <laughs> Exactly. And so what do you guys think makes your culture in particular so strong? Like when you show up every day in the boathouse, um, what keeps the standard so high and makes the culture so strong? Well, well, first off, I think we like to all hang out. Like we all like each other. Like we all respect each other. We all like spending time with each other. I think I think that's that's fundamentally the most like the the thing that oils the machine and keeps it moving along. Um, I'd say and more of a fundamental is that it's the history, like the history of the race. It's, it's such a, I don't know. I sound like I'm drinking the Kool-Aid a bit, but it's, it's, you're such a, it's like a, such a history and tradition that you're going into. You have like a, like a, a responsibility to uphold that. And like, they've been doing the same training, you know, the, the, it, like the, the, the essence of the training has not changed for a hundred, you know, how many, like, was it 166 races now? I think that like you, there's a sense of purpose every day when you walk in that it's like, because it's so singularly focused, there's not a million cups races. There's one that counts. You know, it's like the military mantra that like collective struggle brings people together. And that I think is a big part of it. And which is why we, you know, there's a good culture of everyone respects each other. We work really hard. We have fun together. We spend time outside, you know, 
uh, most of the people that I spend time with outside of the boathouse are the same people I spend time with in the boathouse. And like, you know, I think, I think that is kind of what makes the club something willing to fight for. Like, I think it makes it something that is much bigger than yourself. And you're like, I have to do it not only for me, but I got to do it for all these guys and this club, like this banner, like the alums, this whole, that's the you know, brotherhood's a bit of a dramatic word, but like this whole, you know, thing that we're all a part of, this network that we're a part of that ties us all together. Everyone's been through it. And now it's our turn. Now it's my turn sort of thing to, to contribute to this, to give, to give what I can to this club. Um, and I think, I think that's kind of what, that, you know, that's, that's the essence of the culture. What I thought was really special when our, I came into Cambridge was uh, definitely the, uh, the guys. Immediately I felt super involved and uh, the team is around, what, 20, 25 uh, guys and everyone is, is very tight. Uh, there's a lot of things always happening outside of uh, practice and uh, just the whole aspect of, of the team was just so much, uh, so much fun that definitely added also to, you know, to, to motivation to, you know, do well in the, in the final race. If you enjoy it, it becomes a lot less like a chore. Exactly. Amen to that. <laughs> so true. Yeah, I mean, that chemistry is so important, too. I think, I'm sure all of us chemistry have been... Chemistry is always important. Oh, <laughs> oh, my God, so important. I mean, I'm sure at this point we've all been part of boats where there's, like, one guy that's kind of toxic or one guy that's a whiner or somebody that, like, just brings a little bit of negative energy to a boat. And it's incredible how much effect and how much impact that has on the chemistry of a crew definitely so, so that's really neat that you guys got that chemistry right away and just became so tight before i ask my last question i want to ask you guys a couple questions about the boat race i will ask oxford the same questions <laughs> oh God. and see who knows more about the boat race so oh, i might not know much <laughs> <laughs> so you guys can deliberate if you want before you give me a final answer so feel free. So number one, what year and where was the first boat race held and who won? 1829 yep. in Henley. And did Oxford um, win? I don't know who won the first one. Won, right? I, think, uh, I think Oxford. I think Oxford won. Uh, I think Oxford won. Yeah, yeah I think yeah, Oxford won. won. You're yeah. correct. Nailed it. Perfect. Okay, number two. In addition to this year, the boat race was not held during two other occasions. When was World that? World War I and World War II. Yeah, first and second World War. Okay. Yep, I'll give you that. Okay, name at least three well-known names or celebrities that have raced. Matthew Holland, Dara Alizade, and Natal. <laughs> Easy. Okay, uh, uh, who's the guy? Who's James the guy Crackle. in the house? Hugh Laurie. Crackle, Hugh Laurie, James the, Cracknell. The Winkle, did the Winklevoss twins do it? And the Winklevoss twins. That's four. Yeah. I mean, we can do this all day. Like uh, <laughs> Hugh Laurie, Dan Snow, Lord Snowden, the Winklevoss twins. Ooh, Lord Snowden's a good one, actually. He was a cop, yeah. too. Yeah. Oh, I don't like it. Was, I made this too easy. Okay. <laughs> There's also a How Supreme Court Justice in the United Kingdom who cocks the 1970 Bluebird. I mean, we can do this all day. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Okay. You guys are good. Okay. How many wins does each team have? Uh, I think uh, Cambridge has 84. 84 now, yeah. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Is 84, 81 or something? Uh, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. So 80 to 82. I think now it might be 84. I think it's 84. I, I think 84 I wins 84. for Cambridge. I think 80. It could be 80. What do we say? 84. Would it be four difference? Maybe. 84, 80? 83, 80, that. something like that. that. Anyway, I think 80. Let's go with that. You are correct. 84 and 80. Nah. <laughs> well done, team. Okay. What happened in 1877 in terrible weather that is still a huge point of contention amongst both teams? Was that the dead heat to Oxford by one foot or something? Judged by honest John Phelps or something. He was blind and one eye. <laughs> he was like at the pub or something, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was judging. From, is, that the, is that the one? Is it the dead heat by however many feet? It is. It's like, it Oxford, like a dead heat to Oxford by three yeah, feet or something. Like, and the, guy, the umpire was blind in one eye or something. I read that that was actually not necessarily true, that a newspaper might have made that up. 
I'm not sure. Oh, it sounds right, like but... Cambridge One then. Like... Yeah, it's a fun story. I'll have that. <laughs> it is. It... Number six. How many times has at least one of the boats sunk during the race? Men's or women's? Men's. Okay. Uh, uh, so seven, 72 or 70 something was the Cambridge sinking, right? I think it's like four or five. I think it's quite a lot. Oh, uh, that's a good question. I couldn't tell you. Is it like four? Can we go with four? Whack them. Yeah. It's actually six. Oh. Six. Oh. Yeah. So a couple oh. times both boats have sunk, but at least one of them six times. Wow. I know it's a lot, right? Yeah. And some of them seem really scary too. Like some of them really did not seem okay. Okay, number seven. In 2012, there were four major disruptions that even led to the race being restarted mid-race. What were they? The four major disruptions? Yeah. The, the, swimmer, the, swimmer, the swimmer. The swimmer. Um, the broken oar. Or broken oar. Oh, um, Alex Woods collapsed. Oh, yeah. Well, that was after the race. I don't know if that would have... Count? I don't know. I can't think of four otherwise. Uh, okay, okay, the last one is is kind of a big deal, but it's not as obvious as some of the other ones that you've said. Was it something oh, was that it they challenged someone... afterwards? Yeah. Okay, wait, wait. Uh... Was it something they challenged afterwards? So they, like, they took it yeah. to the umpires. Uh, did they try to tap it up when they were restarting? Oh, yeah, I read about that. I, I don't know. I'm 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 I'm, yeah. I'm shooting I'm shooting from the here. Give us the answer. What is it? Okay. Yeah, I don't know what the okay. So you guys got all of them collapsing. Yep. Alex Woods collapsing. The swimmer. The broken oar after the clash. And it was the first time that a winner was declared without a winning time. Oh. Uh, they they, they, they challenged little, that. I I guess yeah. That, I mean they said they did. Okay. Number eight. How many different official courses has the race been run on? So the three. Tideway, Henley, Henley and Ely. Ely. Yeah, I think three. Was it Ely also? Yeah, it was in Ely yeah. for one of the war ones. Yeah. I think Ely, I think three. I put four because was it one of them. They no. um, okay, so it was Henley. Yep. Um, Westminster to Putney. Oh yeah, no, she's right. She's right. There was a Westminster to Putney boat race. Yeah. Right. Mortlake to Putney. And then the current. It so, definitely happened to Ely. It definitely happened to Ely, yeah. I, I challenged like the it. question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> That's fair. Okay. Number nine. What coin is used for the coin toss? Oh. Uh, Dara, you shouldn't have that. Yeah. A two-sided coin. Is that a gold? It's not a gold sovereign, is it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's too long, though. <laughs> it is actually <laughs> okay. Last one Which station claims the most wins, Surrey or Middlesex? Oh, cool. I that's think good. Surrey does I at the moment. Surrey. Yeah, that's I thought this was actually really interesting. No, it's, it's, not, it's, not a, it's, it's not a tie anymore. I think it was a tie. I thought it was a, I, my thing was like, I thought it was a tie a few years ago. Or no, maybe it is a tie. Mm. No, it can't be because it's just sorry. Is it sorry? Sorry, yeah. It is Surrey. Okay. Yep. But it's so close. Yeah, 78 to 76. Yeah, yeah that is it was like a tie few, Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess it just shows, like, better crew. Last thing I'd love to know are some of your favorite memories at Cambridge, like, during this year when you guys were together, one on the water and one off the water. Our coach, Rob Baker, fell in the water in when we were training once. That was one of the highlights of my year, for sure. That was one of the funniest things I've ever seen. Because we pushed off, right? <laughs> it was a little bit out of pose. He was standing on the landing stage, and I pushed, we pushed the boat off, and it obviously moved the landing stage, and we suddenly hear this splash, and he's like swimming there in all this clothes. He's going to hate us for saying that. <laughs> okay, that's pretty good. It was fall, and it was, uh, yeah, it was in, what, it was in November, right? Yeah, it was a while ago. It was cold. And I reckon probably the biggest highlight has to be winning. Like that was pretty fun. Like that was quite special. For me, also one of the highlights was definitely the um, the board announcement, and you know, in London and the city hall. It was just so much, so much fun because everything. It was such a serious event, but we just had also so much, so much fun. It does and make you then, feel like you know, you had, yeah, exactly. And you had you know the bridge right there, and. Uh, it was yeah for me that was one of the highlights probably 
we're behind the uh, we're behind winning the board race. And we're you're all taking the piss a little bit. We're all like in the background, like doing push ups <laughs> to try and make yourself look bigger. When you put Hike up the uni as high as you can. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, I was gonna say, uh, Derek. Yeah, really, it it looked good. You pulled up that yeah. high. I high. know. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, I know. I, that's, I, you have to pull it up. I think it's we a huge move. a lot of time perfecting the perfect low. There was a lot of experiment that went into that. Those tan lines yeah. are gonna make themselves. No, no, no. I mean, yeah. quads were on point. It was really. Yeah. I, I did. I was. This, this is the appreciation that I like. <laughs> um, yeah, I have oh, to yeah. also say, yeah, winning winning the race for me is the, just the best because it's just like i mean for me it was a it was a it was like a lot of relief like ugh, like okay we like um and then that it's that slowly like as the pain like officially i'm like oh like oh my god and then it's like oh like the pain kind of slowly realizes in like my limbs and then the slow realization like okay like all oh, and like it's kind of the flash of all the year it zooms into that one moment and then you know like hugging each other and like the crowd on the bridge and it's it was yeah and then you get to go into the, the shore and life is good that's amazing that's really amazing well thank you guys so so much for your time and for going through all of that with me and You're welcome. Thank you. it's really really great to hear your stories and is there anywhere that you'd like for people to follow you on social media you wouldn't want to follow me i'm not very interesting <laughs> I think you're very interesting. For, for updates on uh, the powerhouse of Bermuda Rowing, please follow at Dara Alizada on Instagram. Like, it's, it's a movement. Look out. My uni, I, I ordered them in March and they just arrived, actually. Yeah. Um, really? Yeah, yeah, the Bermuda Uni. Bermuda has um, awesome, awesome uni suits. Uh, here, here, I'll, I'll, I'll show it to you real quick. Yeah, I want to see it. Oh, wow. Those, those oh, that's cool. new, new one. That is beautiful. Yeah, what do the what do the legs look like? Oh, that's really cool. That is stunning, Dara. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out to Boathouse for the beginning. But, you need to um, get us some of those, Dara. What? You need to get us some of those. Uh, you got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got I got some spares. Uh, not my first rodeo with what? the whole uni game. All right. Well, thank you guys again. And for everyone else listening, um, you can always find me at Iron Will Wit or The Candid Cox on Instagram and Snapchat and YouTube. And we will see you with Oxford next time.